one. Welcome to uh, the latest installment of Fragments of Silicon Reviews. Uh, sorry I might seem a bit out of sorts this week. I'm just recovering from, well, some personal trauma. More on that on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially, probably during uh, MSP. But, anyway. So, we got two games up this week. First First is Starship Titanic, or if you want the full title, Douglas Adams, Starship Titanic. So, um, first off, this is the rare game that we were not gifted. Um, this was actually bought, and, you know, this is in honor of, well, wanted to feature a night dive game in between appearances, and this is their latest one. Currently. Let's see. Uh, Which is not to say that the game itself is recent, but uh, it's on Steam now. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, most of their games are not recent. Yeah, and also, they got also the, they got a lot of weird situations where they publish a game on Steam, but they don't publish the game elsewhere. Like, they published um, Starship Titanic on Steam, but they didn't pu- uh, publish Starship Titanic on. Uh, GOG. Uh, I forget who did it on the uh, GOG, but it wasn't them. Like, you know, I- I'm sure there are reasons for this, but um, they're immaterial. So, you know, the, you know, technically speaking, this came out alongside uh, D the game, but they had actually released that months prior on GOG. So, this is technically their latest release. I hope that um, clarifies everything. Like, anyway, um, so where to start on this one? Well, okay, so I'm hoping our audience knows who Douglas Adams is. Otherwise, I'm going to say just stop listening to this and go pick up the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, at least the original, uh, the uh, the first three books. I wasn't a fan of uh, either. Uh, so long, and thanks for all the fish, or mostly harmless. I've only watched. They're definitely the a little bit. They're definitely a little bit different, and mostly harmless doesn't have a very good ending. No, he, wrote it, he wrote it when he was kind of depressed, and then he died before he got to make another book to make it better. Yeah, and Starship Titanic was pretty close to the end. There, he. It was released in 1998. Uh huh. Yeah. And it wasn't. It wasn't his first dalliance with adventure games. Um, in fact, no, there was a there was an actual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy adventure game, wasn't there? Yes, I actually played it. I'm like, um, it's home to one of the most infamous puzzles of all time. Ah, uh, yes, the Babelfish puzzle, where every time you think you've solved it, something stupid happens and you have to add another ten steps. Right. I will not lie, I use the guide full sail in that game. Uh, it's like, this is actually, I think, his third adventure game, because he also helped with the, um, uh, the adventure game called Bureaucracy, which was based off of his... Uh, uh, it was like some misadventure with I, I think the British bureaucracy. He was he moved to a new home or something like that. But this one, you know, this one was is like um, I hesitate to use the word magnum opus, and mm-hmm. there are reasons for that which I'll elaborate on. But you know, this was his big stab at you know the adventure gaming scene of the late nineties. Uh, and for, the, for those who aren't 
familiar with what it looked like back then. It's like, I, I think the perception that people get these days is, if, you know, are still of like the you know the two great adventure houses you know Sierra and especially Lucas Arts. I'm like, adventure games weren't just you know those two um, publishers. Mm-hmm. In fact, okay, Starship Titanic flows from one of the most prominent adventure game types of the late '90s, and that's the Mist Clone. Like, and there's no way around it. This game is patterned after Miss, you know, pretty whole cloth. Yeah, it's pretty you know, evident. As, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like, you know, uh, and that it's a three D pre rendered explorable environment. Right. Yeah, and it's like, it, and it's even set up like um, what they call. Hypercard style. Um, that's named after the way um, Mist did its graphical renders. Um, that's a long story. That kind of that's a it's a separate tangent. But anyway, yeah, the way it works is you know um, you don't have free movement in Starship Titanic like you don't in the original version of Mist or Mist masterpiece edition you didn't get full movement until the um th- uh, the full 3d remake real mist mm-hmm. yeah. it's more like uh when you're in, in a room you get to choose what other what exit of that room to take to get to the next room pretty much right and it's like every movement you make is like you move to a new slide or you move to a new painting because it, yeah the enti- you know the entirety of the game is made up of pre-rendered backgrounds, which you know which can do many things, but they cannot do smooth motion between things. Yeah. It's like, in fact, moving from place to place can be kind of clunky, like even for the time. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you'll you'll go a place you didn't want to go. That happened to me a lot. <laughs> I'm like, you getting fan noise? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's from you or Twilight, but there's a sort of a constant... Yeah, constant anyway. blowing. Don't know what to tell you. Anyway. Um, getting back on track here, so... Another thing that typified, um, well, Mist and the progeny that um, kind of spewed forth in its wake is the way puzzles were done. You know, once again, when you think of your typical 90s adventure game, um, you think of in guys, knock it off. Okay. Um, anyway, um, when you think of 90s adventure games, um, you think of inventory puzzles. You know, you you look for the thing, and you find the other thing, and you use those objects together. And a lot of pointing and clicking. Mm-hmm. Right. And now, there's a lot of pointing and clicking in Starship Titanic, but um, puzzles, oper- you know, and... There are inventory puzzles. There's actually three kinds of puzzles here. Um, one of which I'll get to in a little bit because that kind of gets into Starship Titanic's most unique feature. Um, but the way it's done in um, like Mist is it, it's more environmental logic puzzles. Like, you're supposed to find clues as opposed to items. Yeah. And there are there are usually things you can talk to to try to get clues, but what you can talk to to get clues isn't always obvious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, like, a good example, um, 
regards to Starship Titanic is... Oh, jeez. I'm um, trying to access the email server. Mm-hmm. Like... Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm like, so... In order to access the email server, uh, I'm like, the emails of the three creators of the Starship Titanic, um, you, what you've got to do is you've got to go into... I'm trying to remember what they called it. Uh, we'll call it the bust room. But, like, the, uh, you know... The, it's um, kind of an art gallery. No, that's no, that's the room adjacent. Like, it, it's a room where it has th- uh, the busts of the three creators, and um, what you got to do is you've got to find a way to um, find the passwords, and that involves a fuse box and turning off, uh, turning off the right switch. And, you know, uh, jotting down what the actual passwords are in relation to the creators. Mm-hmm. So it's not very intuitive. Like, And there are other things that are not very intuitive either. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, I'm like... Uh, I'm like, this game is pretty um, steeped in... I... It was... Quite frankly, bad adventure game design. I, I feel like this is a game where you will probably need to look at a guide, but also yeah. looking at you a know, guide won't. I'm going to say uh, you're you're probably um, required to look at a guide because so here's kind of the rub. Um, this was one of those games uh, that you uh, like. You needed to have things from the box in order to complete. Ah, uh, yeah. There's one puzzle where there's a picture on the back of the box of a room where mm-hmm. you need to uh, make the room look like that or something. And uh, also, this game originally shipped with a pair of uh, blue and red uh, 3D glasses that are used near the end of the game. Mm-hmm. Like, you actually have to wear them, so that's okay. a thing. Yeah, it's like at the very tail end of the Feelys DRM era. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we've gotten a little bit far ahead without uh, really talking about the premise of the game, though. Well, we're talking about the mechanics and how... Right. You know, and we're not quite done with, with that. Yeah, because, that's true. Yeah, we can keep going. Sorry. Yeah. Because okay, so the mo- uh, by far the most unique feature of Starship Titanic is the um, the parser system. Um, so this game attempted to fuse you know then modern day um, graphical adventures with the old eighties uh, interactive fiction. There are other games that did this too. Um, right. One of the later Leisure Suit Larry games did, I think. Yeah. Um, Six. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, point of order is this game, ha- you can also talk to people. Like, you can actually type in, you know, responses to various robots that you talk to. And, you know. And almost order- everything you talk to is a robot because there are no living people on this ship. Mm hmm. Not anymore, anyway. Aside from you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, and there is some puzzle solving involved with, you know, um, with the talking feature, but honestly, it felt a bit under, it felt undercooked in that area. It kind of mm-hmm. did. Yeah. It, it, it's like, you know, um, and really, uh, you know, anyway, so now I suppose we should get to the, um, well, premise. This game started out as a footnote in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about the Starship Titanic, the most luxurious starship that was designed to be completely impossible to have anything go wrong. So, of course, immediately after it was launched, it suffered a sudden massive existence failure and uh, just ceased to exist as far as anyone could tell. Of course, apparently what happened is that it crashed into the broom of the player of this game. Yeah. Sort of. There's more to it yeah. than that. It's like it's yeah. not exactly clear if this 
um, Starship Titanic is the actual Starship Titanic from the Douglas Adams book. I mean, you're going to get connections and allusions and all that stuff because, you know, same author and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's confirmed, like, either way that, yes, this is the actual Starship Titanic from that book. Yeah, I've been assuming it was. I don't think it, well, whatever. Anyway, Starship, like, what, the first thing you have to do when you turn in the game, turn on the game is, in the game, turn on the game. Yeah. Yeah, shit gets a little meta. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, yeah. Yeah, it's... It was one of those of the time uh, things, like you know, you you're immediately thrown into the game, but you are well, you in front of your '90s era computer, and what you need to do is you need to put in a disc bearing the internal Starship Titanic logo um, into the computer, and then the game starts. And if, I guess I should mention the reason why I'm not actually playing the game on stream is because it's locked in full screen and I can't get OBS to capture full screen games. And it's kind of unfortunate because it's full screen but the resolution of the game is not what you'd call high. Well, um, what, with, what with being a game from 1998 and all. The resolution was standard um, for the time. Like, yeah, it's, it's like, hard what, 64480? Yes, it's hard-coded to that, which is, you know, like I said, I'd say that it was about as standard as you got uh, for, say, 1998. But it's like, you literally can't change the resolution here because it's all pre-rendered backgrounds. It's like, like you literally cannot change the resolution of pre-rendered backgrounds because that, that's kind of where it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, like, you'd have to you'd have to really muck about in the game to change anything like that to the point of okay. might as well just remake it. Well, yeah, it's like uh, it's like you know you are basically uh, playing the game against uh, a whole bunch of matte paint. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the NPCs sure. are pretty much matte paintings too, but they're little smaller ones. Yeah. Like, um, unlike say something like say Grim Fandango, which used the same style, it's like I think everything here, including the um, robots. Uh, well, man, the robots might be the one thing that aren't. Yeah, you know, they're still. Yeah, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. It doesn't really matter. The the point is, you know, it's stuck at one resolution. It's also, you know, um, going back to the interview from a while back, um, this is one of the games that they didn't have the source code to, so they couldn't really tinker around with it. Uh, um, on the upside, uh, you know, if you're looking for the game you know, to run on modern systems, I mean, here you are. Um, ran perfectly fine for me. Same here. Which, believe me, is a pretty important feat in and of itself. Because, you know, this is a game from, you know, this is a game that was uh, originally coded to work in Windows 95. And yeah, that's probably what most of the port work was, was uh, making it work on Windows 7 and up systems. Yeah, bridging the gap from the 9X kernel to the NT kernel is a bitch, and not many games made it across that gap. Yeah, and, you know, you know uh, it also gets rid of the um, CD swapping. So, this is another one of those things that um, if you didn't live in the era, you really don't know what this is and how fucking annoying it was. Because uh, remember, so, even though it's way the hell more than a three and a half, or even the smaller floppies, a CD could only hold, what was it, like 120 megabytes of data? Um, almost a gig. Yeah, oh, seven, 700 something. 752, I think. 
anyway, yeah. uh, and some games are bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because well, this is all pre-rendered assets, so this is going to be huge uh-huh. at least for the time. Yeah, um, yeah, it was fairly sizable. It, um, if I'm recalling correctly, Starship Titanic was um, three discs. Mm-hmm. And um, three discs, or was it four? Because I know that the version that initially shipped was one disc less than the actual game was. That yes, was a... you heard that right. This game initially shipped with the last qu- with the last segment of the game, just not in the box because oops. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I've read that it's three discs. I'll be honest, I don't know because I didn't own the game back in the nineties. Right. Like. But the uh, you know the point of order is, and you gotta understand that it, it's also not a linear experience in terms of game data. Like different parts of the game are going to be on different discs. Oh wow, that would suck. Oh god, no. And Starship yeah. Titanic is one of them. I'm having bad no. flashbacks to the mid '90s. Please, someone help. So it's not like the PlayStation 2 RPGs where most of the time it was just, oh, it's a new disc because of something, cha- some state in the w- game world had changed. It's, okay, you go to the Arboretum, put in disc one. Uh, okay, to solve the puzzle on the Arboretum, you have to go back to the restaurant, put in disc three. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Starship Titanic apparently had quite a bit of this, especially near the end. You know, you, when you have uh, access yeah. to the most of the ship, and therefore you have puzzles that require access to all of what you have. Right. So basically, this is the definitive edition. Yeah, in the sense that it gets rid of, you know, it gets rid of that um, particular uh, part of the '90s that nobody liked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Hope you take yeah. good care of your disc, kids. If not, well, sucks to be you. No shit. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Oh. Uh. Anyway, uh, there are also some randomly generated puzzles here. Like, um, one of the first is getting to your first room. Because you have to, you have to get yourself upgraded to second and first class. I think at some point in the story. Right. But yeah, you're you're initially assigned to a general room, and uh, it's uh, a number that's on your uh, yeah. what they call what they call in the game a pet, which is sort of a initially it's like what pretty much what a phone is now, except for it can't make calls, but personal electronic thing, as they call it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you get the number, and then you have to find your room, which is a. Uh, not as easy as just going... First off, this is a really big ship. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, uh, that's what the name means, Titanic. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, now, as before, far as before it meant designed to fail, it meant uh, resembling the Titans. Yeah. <laughs> right, and, and Titanic still means, you know, huge. Right. So, you know... It and, just has uh, some particular baggage in the area of uh, navigation. And, well, getting back to the actual story, your job is basically to stop the starship Titanic. It's a hurtling out of control for unknown reasons, and nobody's around. And well, all one, the of the, world- one of the reasons is that the ship's computer is borked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in fact, all of the robots are kind of fucked in the head, uh, with varying degrees of intentionalness. Yeah. Apparently, and, apparently, there is a roundabout way in the game where you can actually, like, directly. I'm going to put huge quotes on this: hack the robots to uh, make them more responsive, or more friendly, or more useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that um, this was sort of turned into a book. Um, as you say, uh, there is a 
uh, it was actually novelized, but not by uh, Douglas Adams. Uh, that was actually done by, of all people, Terry Jones, um, one of the Monty Python uh, troupe. You know, uh, he, he's one of the voice actors in the game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, apparently he wrote the novel version in order to, you know, um, because Douglas Adams was too busy with the game, you know, the actual game. Yeah, and the novelization doesn't give you any puzzle clues, and it has some important differences, but yeah. it'll get you a lot of the same environment if you're not interested in playing a long adventure game. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say, with you know, without spoiling too much... Your overall goal is to recover the uh, the parts of the system. Mm-hmm. Now, like um, kind of literally, like like for whatever reason, um, the central computer's uh, like has actual body parts because it's an arbitrarily uh, powerful and advanced computer, and therefore it is indistinguishable from magic. Right. Right. Anyway, uh, uh, thing. Uh, now as far as enjoyment of this game, that's a really tough question to determine. Um, yes. it's kind of a personal like, thing. <laughs> Like, if you if you find roundabout puzzle solutions frustrating, then you probably already know that adventure games aren't for you. Well, it, but this one definitely isn't. I'm like, well, it's like um, like modern gamers probably should look elsewhere. Like, yeah, it's an old game and it's gonna look old. Mm-hmm. Like, you yeah, know, if graphics is the only thing that gets your engine running, this has pre-rendered graphics. Yeah, I'm like, this look. Uh, this looked good in 1998. Not so much in the year of 2017. Like, I mean, wow, <clears throat> it's not the worst I've seen, but it's pretty bad. Uh, I'm like, I think that's another reason why I never got into these adventure games and never quite liked the art style. And with this game, it's going to be full screen with a very low resolution, so the pixels are probably going to be huge. Yeah, I'm like, oh. Now, um, if you're a Douglas Adams fan, well, you probably already purchased this. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, um, it's, it's uh, a lot less witty than I would have imagined. Like, Though there is a lot of there is a lot of with as with most non terrible text parser things, uh, you can get interesting responses if you say random stuff. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. buried in there, but I'm like you know as far as the actual game goes, it's pretty straightforward actually. Like, it's definitely got some of his humor there. Like I'm um, disarming the bomb. Um, don't hit the button that says disarm the bomb. Well, here's the thing. Um, it's an uh, it's actually an optional puzzle because um, disarming the bomb uh, affects your engine. Right. You know, but I'm like, um, without spoiling the solution, the solution um, is actually a line from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like. Mm-hmm. I, now, in fact, uh, I think the line comes up in relation to a certain drink uh, that you can order at some point. Mm-hmm. Cough, cough, wink, wink, right? Mm. <laughs> like I said, I'm trying not to spoil anything here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, people who already know, they know. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if you don't, you probably will end up looking up a guide anyway. Still. Yeah, if you're playing this game, you're not playing it for logical puzzles. You're playing it for the premise and such wit as there is in the game and jokes and the experience of it. 
Yeah. Also, fuck that, Arabs. Ah, yes, another thing. Aye. If you don't like randomly being insulted over the intercom by an inexplicably alive parrot, this is not the game for you. <laughs> Oddly enough, he has his own. He has his own volume control. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that's about the. Uh, that was the. Uh, that was the puzzle I stopped on before I quit. Actually, it was the. F not the first. It was one uh, because there are several puzzles involving the parrot. Like, um, it was the statue. Oh, yeah, he, he, he's the only other living thing on the ship. Yes. Um, I was stuck on the pistachio puzzle because I couldn't quite figure out how to get him into into um, my room. I, I'm just like, okay, th this isn't working. <laughs> like, let's see. As far as say music goes, like it, it's there, I think. It's atmospheric, but yeah, for most part, it's there. <laughs> they probably didn't have enough room on the CDs for a good soundtrack in addition to all those pre-rendered backgrounds, or a particularly good soundtrack. I'm not saying it's bad or anything, just... It's not bad, just... Not really remarkable. Yeah, it doesn't really hit you, you say. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think that sums up the game in a nutshell. It's like... Um, it's not particularly bad, but like for you know the amount of talent behind the game, uh, you know it's fairly unremarkable. And you know this is probably one of, one of the big reasons why, um, no pun intended, the game sank uh, when it was released. Uh, it's like I'm not exactly sure how like how well or how well it you know, didn't do, but you know, keep in mind this was released in 1998, so we're you know we're hitting the death of the adventure game uh, era pretty hard. Mm -hmm. wow. Interestingly enough, the website's still up, like. The actual yeah. web, dude. The Space Jam website's still up. I yeah, but that's stressed. that's an oddity. Yeah. Yeah, but here's the thing: the company that owns that website, Warner Brothers, is um, definitely still alive. Mm, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's like, you know, the uh, the original company that um, created this, uh, the, the Digital, Digital Village, Village they like went out of business in. 2001. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mainly because uh, it uh, Douglas Adams was a big force there. Uh-huh. Uh, so, I don't know who uh, who's maintaining the site or whatever, but, you know, and believe me, um, looking at the site, it's, it's a loss... Uh, it's a lot less dated than the Space Jam website. Mm -hmm. Not like, that that's hard. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a website built in 1998. Uh -huh. Like, and it's definitely got some 1998 design choices here. But I'm like, it's not something that make that instantly screams, "Holy fuck, the 90s!" All of the 90s. <laughs> like, you go to the Space Jam website. That's what you get there. Mm-hmm. But and it's a uh, like, and I think you do get some uh, like some supplemental um, information like on the um, cast of characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although you could um, probably just as uh, just as well go to like Wikipedia or something to get this. All the different or TV tropes. All the although that will have spoilers. All the different robots with their punny names. Right. Now, one thing that this game is... Oh, actually, never mind. You were probably going to get to that. It's what? I was going to... I was jumping into the price thing. One thing this game is, is affordable. 
Yeah. Uh, in fact, we were. Uh, in fact, this is a good time to talk to, about the price. Um, it's going for six dollars, um, normal price, and I picked it up uh, when it was on sale. It, it was four dollars, um, and it's worth noting that night dive games go on sale pretty regularly for cheaper than that. Like. I wouldn't be surprised if this game showed up for like two dollars or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The point is, even if you don't like this game, uh, you're not gonna feel cheated out of your money. <laughs> no, unless you value six dollars that much. Yeah, I think this is definitely a game that's yeah. worth trying. Especially at that yeah. price. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't it's like, like it, it's uh, certainly not the end of the world. Yeah. I mean, that uh, happened I'll, in book five. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'll issue two ratings on this. Um, from an objective standpoint, uh, this is a pretty typical adventure from the late 90s in both style and design. It's, you know, got some, it's got some unique flourishes. Uh, you know, mainly with the parser system, but you know, it really wasn't breaking any um, molds mechanic uh, in its uh, mechanics. Like, um, and as far as the Douglas Adams fan goes, um, sure, go for it, but you know, it's not going to be. You know, a Dick Gentry novel, set, let's say. Um, yeah. It's not as... I mean, as an adventure game, it can't be, because it's not as he it's not as heavily pl or as directly plotted as a book. Yeah. You have Personal to find the stuff yourself instead of having everything sequentially served to you. Yeah. Personally, I couldn't stand the game. It's like, I, you know, I... Never really liked Mist or its clones. Like I just never gelled with that style of gameplay. It has its place. Uh, I'm like, and I will say at least Starship Titanic didn't make the egregious sin of having its having some of its puzzles based off of sound. Um, yes, Mist did that. And Mist did that in an era where having speakers hooked up to your computer was not a given. It's also, you know, and if you happen to be deaf, well, good luck solving that shit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know, it, it, it's like, you know, I, I, I get the idea of playing it by ear, but, you know, that can yeah. be difficult if you literally can't hear, you know, the puzzle. Mm-hmm. No, not the only game that ever did that, but, you know, worth noting. You know, and like I said, you're probably going to have to get, use a guide to get through this. Yeah. Um, you know, if only because, you know, like, uh, there are some puzzles that um, required, I, you know, the, the 3D glasses, for example. Uh, and I think the like the last puzzle used something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think if you had to use the 3D glasses on the um, the picture you brought from home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yeah. Um, final rating is uh, go for it if you're feeling well adventurous, but you know. Be aware that you know th this is from a certain era, and it's going to have the trappings of that era. You know, I I'm like, and yeah, I'd rate that. I'd rate this as at least a try it. So do I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, right. I think that's going to about do it for Starship Titanic. Um, be sure to tune in next for. Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force uh, Because short names are for losers Yeah 
<laughs> it's another Idea Factory game, and of course, we have opinions on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, until next time, I wish you good gaming. <laughs>